Okay, I think I'll start my second lecture now. Uh, we have about 100 participants. I will be sharing my screen now.
Um, just a minute. Okay, so everyone is able to see my screen and uh, let's start the talk. Um, I will go to the slide straight away where we uh, stopped yesterday. So I was about to start the spectroscopy uh, section. So let's go there. Santosh, uh, is my screen seen? Okay. Okay, we kind of stopped here where I uh, mentioned about the continuous spectrum uh, and how, uh, suppose this is the score of the star and then you have a gas cloud around it. If the glass cloud is hot enough, it can have emission spectrum. <laughs> Or if it is cold, then it will have absorption spectrum. Okay. Now, uh, we will talk about spectroscopy. So this is a basic plan for a spectrometer. Now, if you remember, uh, I mentioned yesterday that Newton, in any basic optics book, you will find Newton sitting with a prism and sunlight coming in from a small hole in his room and he looks at a nice spectrum on the wall. So of course, prism is the simplest form of uh, spectrometer, or as technically we'll call as this uh, dispersion uh, element, but there could be higher versions like grating and others. So what essentially people do is that this D is representing the telescope. That is the primary mirror or lens, it doesn't matter. And it gets into a small slit where it is focused so that you can isolate only the star or if it is a galaxy, the full light from the galaxy. There were many questions yesterday in the sheet, which I answered. Uh, even if there are two stars, you will see only the combined light unless you can actually distinguish them separately. Okay, so that's the situation. Now, uh, this is the dispersing element, which could be a prism or gating. And there is a lens here called the collimeter. So in principle, most of the time, almost 99% of the time, the disperser is kept in what is called as a parallel section. So the light gets focused for this lens also, and it makes it parallel. And then again, you have another lens to focus it on the detector, which could be a screen or a CCD or photographic plate. This is another view of the same thing, except that now this is where the slit where the star sits, I mentioned here, the star is focused here. So you will put the star here. And I also mentioned the star is continuously dancing in the night because of twinkling of the uh, starlight, which is due to the atmosphere. And uh, so this is what is called the seeing disk. This at good telescope sites in dark place and high mountains, it can be a, as good as this edge to edge can be about one arc second. Otherwise, it's typically two arc seconds. And this is the slit. So you are not getting full light into the slit. Okay, these parts are left out. So that is where you need the optics to be very well designed. Either you want the whole scattered portion to be inside the slit or you don't. So anyway, if this is the situation, then this is how the spectrum will look. All the colors are seen. And on the spectrograph, corresponding to this slit, you will have different light being focused. So you will have all the colors sitting there and then you can analyze this image. So before we move into the actual instruments, uh, I will again start defining certain things. So spectral resolution is R given by lambda by delta lambda. So if you remember the photometric bands, which I showed yesterday, they were about thousand angstroms wide, which means this, Denominator is 1000 angstrom and wavelength lambda in case of uh, B filter is 4500 angstroms. If it is visible, 
it is 5500 and 6500 for red so this will come out the r will be about so it is let's say 4500 by 1000 so it's about 4.5 so well within 10 this r so that is actually a low resolution right and that's why you can call it photometry the next stage because the bands are 1000 angstroms the next stage is you start improving the resolution which means you will sample the black body in smaller and smaller sections so now the r is more than 10 and typically up to 100 now some people may like to call it narrow band photometry or the spectroscopy we will call it as low resolution spectrum it is only depending on the user but ultimately it is the r which is defined so in this case r is less than 100 next is medium resolution spectroscopy where r is now between 100 and 10000 this is where gratings will come as we will see and finally high resolution where much more higher resolution instruments like uh, very high resolution grating of Fourier transform or fabric perot will come so i will be actually touching these three in different aspects describing different instruments and so on so uh, as we go along uh, you will notice this and of course at the end of the talk you can post your questions on the google sheet which i will answer later in the day like yesterday or i will give some time for you to ask by raising your hands so this is another very important thing um, not normally discussed in spectroscopy uh, lectures it's called l plus, is l cross r that is luminosity and resolution is a constant and this whole concept was done by a french uh, astronomer and in Fr in french this output is called attendee which in units of centimeters per vessel radian is a solid angle and this omega is a solid angle and area is the accepting area of the spectrometer not the not the telescope because telescope area has been already brought down to the parallel section, if you remember. And that's why this attendue has a lot of confusion with the word luminosity. In fact, it is even more confusing because luminosity appears three times in three different contexts in my set of lectures and also in general. So luminosity of a star is the total light. Luminosity is also, in case of spectroscopy, directly links to the spectral type, uh, which we didn't discuss so much yesterday. And finally, the luminosity of the instrument. Essentially, in this context, all it means is that you have an instrument as shown by my hand. On this side, you have the light coming in and this side it goes out. So I have 100 photons coming and I get 90 photons. So essentially, the efficiency is 90%. And what you get is the final output, which is only 90. So that's the kind of uh, terminology which we are using here. And this is constant, which means whatever an instrument, whether it is a prism or a grating or higher resolution instrument, it will have a, this constant, which itself will be uh, different for different combinations. So either you uh, make the luminosity or the output of the instrument much higher, then of course the resolution will be higher. And reverse, if the luminosity, if the resolution is very high, then you will have very little light coming out. So easy way to understand this is, remember the black body radiation. And uh, so if this is the black body radiation, as you follow my cursor, we had three bands. So each of them 1,000, 1,000 angstroms, right? But now if I go to narrow band, I make it 10 angstroms. Then I'm sampling the same black body curve in many, many smaller bins. So each bin, the contribution from the black body is correspondingly small, which means if I try to take the photon, so suppose, the black body spectrum has 1000 photons total divided into three, B, V, and R, then 333 each, right? Equal division, let us say. Now, if I make it 10 times narrower, so I make now uh, this whole division into 10, 10 angstroms, then each one will have only 33 angstroms left. So that 1000 photon will come down to only uh, one tenth of that. So as you can see, each bin will now have less number of photons. So what will you do? Either you increase the telescope size to collect more photons and that number can go up or be happy by going for lower resolution. So we'll come to these aspects very soon. Uh, this is a comparison of a grating, uh, what is the omega r, 
the, the, the L cross R thing. Similarly for a fabric curve. And the ratio given here is uh, about 100, which means the fabric bureau, even though it is, will show the what is a fabric bureau, but it will sample only very small part of the spectrum. But within that bin, its output is 100 times better compared to a similar bin for grid. So that's where the, the big uh, advantage is there. And this was realized by a French optical person and astronomer called Jacquino. In fact, there is a book by Jacquino. You can search the Google and find out. So highly technical, but these are the in simple terms I am showing. So where all these definitions are given, the field of view in terms of uh, steradians. So you have all done the sodium D1, D2 line experiment correct? during your BSC or what. So if these two hands are the D1 and D2 line separated by six angstroms, now if I sample with a very small slit, and I, of course, move the grating or, or whatever. Then I will be seeing a nice spectrum coming like this. So the spectrum will smart like this, come down and again come. But this in-between gap is my six angstroms. But now suppose I make the slit wider. Then what will happen? I will stop seeing this dip and it will be just a two humps or bumps. Which means now what has happened? I have increased the slit size. I am accepting more light because increase the size, but my resolution has gone down. So this combination is just like your uh, your uh, quantum mechanics. You know, uh, the this multiplication is a constant for that particular instrument. So that's why increase the slit width, more light is accepted, but the resolution goes down, and of course the reverse also. But for some dispersers, as I said, for the same resolution, they can accept more light. So they are more luminous. Now you can kind of get a hint about this word luminous. In this context is actually the throughput of the instrument, which in French, the throughput, the direct translation is attended. So L cross R will be fully utilized for such an instrument. Now, the, another challenge is, of course, you have to couple the uh, spectrometer with the telescope field. Of. So this is always important because you don't want to lose the light, which is already so faint from a galaxy or star. So this coupling calls for all the design parameters. We are not going technically too much into detail, but this aspect is very important. So let us see uh, some comparison. Now, this kind of work you will not find in any book because several years back during my PhD, I developed a fabric instrument and I had prepared all this work. So it's, it's a good information for you, which you will not easily find in a book. So suppose I make the area and resolution comparable for, in this case, a grating and a fabric mm -hmm. Then the fabric gives us much larger output as I was just now telling. Of course, within the same spectral bin. Or if you make A and L similar, then you will get much higher resolution. And the last option is even more better because if I make these two comparisons, then A, the area of the instrument becomes very small, which means, as you saw yesterday, you have to balance the telescope so at the end, where you are putting your eyepiece or the detector, if you put this instrument, a very light instrument will do the job. Now, let's see. so this again comes, this concept again comes just like two stars. Now there are two spectral lines, right? Exactly the same Rayleigh criteria, but now this axis is instead of distance between two stars, it is the wavelength axis. So same thing, two, two spectral lines, right? So what may happen, uh, though I will don't have a picture, in case of Orion Nebula, it's a gas which is continuously in motion. And uh, if you take the full image, you will get a line. But if you have a telescope which can see parts of that, then you will find differential motion of the gas. Some gas is coming towards you. Some is going away. Just a Doppler effect, which means even if there, there is one spectral line, there could be a kink here, which shows that there is a differential motion within that gas. So this is the first indication that within the gas, there will be a differential motion. Now in the next, these two slides, I'm comparing all the three, low resolution, medium and high. So the low resolution, as I said, the Newton's experiment prism, it is based on diffraction. The grating is based on diffraction and interference for high resolution instruments. Uh, for 
for the moment you can skip this because it is more technical prism means there is only one spectrum coming there is no confusion there right on the value of the thing and of course the range because prism can be of course non glass item like yesterday some question was there uh, glass will absorb ultraviolet but certain crystals uh, allow ultraviolet light so it can go all the way to infrared 2000 angstrom to infrared and they fall in the r below 5 r i defined just now grating comes in between r is now between 500 and 10000 and gratings can work uh, from x rays to micro and finally the high resolution instruments i will only touch one particular part the fifth dipper here will be ultraviolet to sub millimeter and of course the resolution uh, coming out from this is much higher than 10000 so this is the table continued uh, if this is the r that same uh, maximum resolving power it is 10 times better for grating and and this is 10 times better than this so this and this are 100 times better so the return due the same word again i am using here is the output in this case of prism is worse again all this relation is within that spectral bit better and best and l cross r in this case is almost 100 times at 100 i mean almost up to 500 times better than the prism now how does the spectrum come out it is direct and there is no ambiguity there is a single nice spectrum sitting on the ccd or screen here you will have overlapping orders so you have to sort them out and the last one is even more because now the complexity is increasing we are asking more and more higher resolution result so here uh, you don't even see the spectrum you have to actually do a deconvolution which was a challenge 30 40 years back when the computers were slow but fast fourier transform and other things have improved that and this is no more a difficulty uh i will skip this written part but i will just show you uh just this thing here yeah, first so now this is an absorption line in the spectrum you remember uh, if it is a hydrogen line then in the atmosphere of the star you will have a line dip like this now if i integrate this curve in fact this is interesting if earlier students i used to give this as an exercise i asked them to do this on a graph sheet and actually count all the small squares of the graph sheet and it turns out that it becomes a rectangle which is the same area as what is enclosed inside this so what it means this because this is a wavelength axis so this is what is called as equivalent width means this spectral line has a equivalent width on the x axis as a rectangle of some value right so this is concept is same even if this was an emission line going up like this the concept doesn't change is the area under the curve and this is where the continuum line starts so a lot of astronomy and astrophysics can be done from the equivalent width because this line has broadened due to various things happening as we will see very soon in line broadening and it can also happen inside the star the gas motions and so on due to doppler effects and various other things so this information can be worked back and do a lot of astrophysics on the on that particular object so let me go back here so what are the possibilities of this line broad the narrowest is just like a laser you know it's a it's a quantum effect as we will soon see this can be very narrow so typically it can be milli angstrom so and doppler broadening is because of doppler effect we will explain that doppler of actually effect has two parts one is the broadening and the shift so both have to be understood the overall effect is a doppler effect then pressure some stars may have very high pressure in their atmosphere so that will also broaden the spectrum and lastly of course the rotation of the star can also it's kind of a doppler effect which shifts the spectral line as we will see so this is the first thing uh this curve uh, just to understand i'm trying to compare a doppler line which is this line okay because it's a it's a it's a it's an effect due to the random motion of the gas particles emitting the thing and lorentz is this where the wings don't fall even at infinity here as it is falls very fast almost becomes zero just to show the shapes i have shown this but we will talk now more about the width of these lines or these lines 
So let's pick up the first thing. Uh, so what is the energy level term of this you do right in your early atomic physics? The atoms are excited to higher level E2 and they come down and emit the light, which is H2. Or let's see why that doesn't matter. Right? So this is the basic concept. The atoms stay at this level for some time. And for example, the daytime sun excites the atmospheric atoms, particularly oxygen and other elements, and puts them in this level. Then as the sun sets, they slowly come down and emit in infrared. So the first kind of broadening, so I am now going to talk about uh, one, two, three, four, all these one by one. Okay. So this is the natural body. It is happening because of the transition. Just now I showed. For any spectral line, it can be a mercury, it can be a hydrogen line, anything. In the lab, we have all done, I think, experiments with hydrogen lamp. So essentially, it's a very uh, thin line. Uh, but the width of the line depends on the time it spends on the upper level and coming down. So typically, it is between minus a micro to nanoseconds. Right? And that defines essentially the frequency or the, the bandwidth of the natural body. And the shape is Lorentzian, I just showed. So, for example, at a 6000 red line, this is milli angstroms, right? Angstrom, length, hundredth, and then. So, this is milli. 0 0.00, very small line, but the shape, remember, is, uh, is Lorentzian. And this can be, of course, mathematically calculated. I am not showing sure that. The next is the Doppler effect. Now, this you have to carefully understand what is happening is. This top picture is nicely showing, uh, just a minute. So this is showing a set of atoms in that gas. So for example, if you have a tube light in which the mercury atoms are moving randomly, of course, and all of you have, at least now the modern tube lights are based on LED, but the gas-based tube lights, which are slowly going out of fashion, because of efficiency. You must have removed, your parents might have told to change the tube light, slightly warm, right? So the temperature of the room to reach 25, it will be about 30. It's very normal. So at that temperature, these are moving random, right? By both statistics. And some of the atoms, so this is the way you are looking at the tube light. Some are approaching you, some atoms are going sideways and so on. So this is the net effect is like a Gaussian. And you can see the colors I've shown. This side is blue. And this side is red. So some which are going away are red and coming towards you are blue. Right? And you form this spectral line with the center. And this is the basically the Gaussian effect. Okay. And this whole line also can shift if the total tube light is moving. So, for example, hypothetically, if somebody asks you to hold the tube light and run at very fast thing, then depending whether you are approaching or or going, now the whole tube light is moving. So this whole line will shift on the x-axis depending on the Doppler shift. So that is the basic concept of the uh, Doppler effect. And it has shift and broadening two parts. So what is the Doppler broadening? This is a simple relation, temperature, and this is the mass number of the emitting species. In case of mercury, it is quite high, 190 or something. In oxygen, it will be 16 and so on. There's some constant and this is the center of it. So you can actually measure the uh, width of this line and infer the temperature of the gas. In fact, this is a very standard process. If you have a high resolution and you can resolve the Doppler broadening of the gas or whatever object, then you can directly estimate the temperature. And temperature is, of course, assumed at thermal equilibrium. So in case of iron line from sun, this is the sun's temperature. Sun has a lot of iron deposits. It's a G-type star. So now you see this is 0, 03. This is 1 tenth. It is broader than the uh, natural body. And this T has come from this. If you put in these numbers, you will get 0 0.03 or the vice versa. If you put in this, you will get the temperature. And it is Gaussian shape. This is a, another important thing called Zeeman effect. You have all heard. If the spectral line in a gas and you put two strong magnets, then they will split. It's called the Zeeman effect. 
This is very difficult to see in the lab because you need very strong magnetic fields. And that's how it was discovered. But in case of stars uh, or many astrophysical situations, the magnetic fields are very strong. In fact, uh, so just although it is not a face-to-face -face talk today, uh, I would have asked this to the audience. Typically, what is the magnetic field on the surface of Earth? So it is 0.5 cos. Okay, some changes are there, but on Sun, it is about generally on the surface of Sun star is only about a gauss. But where there are dark spots on Sun, the magnetic field shoots up because there is a convergence of magnetic lines, and the magnetic field can be very strong, even up to kilo, kilo gauss, thousand gauss. In fact, there is a star called Bernard star, which has 30 kilo gauss, very strong magnetic field, which will have an enormous splitting of this line. So this, uh, it will be equal splitting. And from that splitting and using this formula, you can measure the magnetic field or estimate the magnetic field. So this is now another factor of 10. Now we have come down to the splitting is this. So actually in a star which has strong magnetic field, like these AP stars up to 30 kilohertz, you will not only have the broadening, you will see the splitting all together. So it will have a split like this. And each of these lines will be much broader. The natural broadening is way smaller and hidden inside. So this is the rotational thing I was telling. Now, this is a typical spectrum of a star, which is not rotating. But suppose there are two stars which are moving around each other, which is very common because, as I said, 60% or more stars are actually binary stars or even triple stars. So let's say it's only binary star. Then what will happen? Each line uh, will tend to... Uh, so, uh, no, I'm sorry. So this is non-rotating, this is a rotating star, not two stars. Two stars gives another uh, aspect altogether. So if the star starts rotating, then this line will broaden, okay, because of the rotation itself. So these lines will be broadened. So what will happen? As time goes, you keep observing, the spectrum looks like this, then it will go like this, it will go like this, and it will keep on happening. So with this shift in time, you can measure the rotation. Now, we are talking of the uh, prism is too simple, so I am not going to describe. But let's take the grating. So this is a typical laboratory setup where you have a lamp or a candle or whatever, and there is a mirror okay, or a collimating lens. And this is the section which is collimated where you put the grating. And this is the focusing uh, mirror or lens. And the spectrum is sitting nicely on this with different colors. If I rotate this, this spectrum shifts up and down. And so suppose there's a small slit here. What you will see on the slit will be a spectrum coming out as different colors pass through the in front of the slit. So now again, back to some definitions. What is this grating or prism or other instruments which I was describing? It's called the dispersal. The definition is simple. It separates the light into different wavelengths. The white light, like from sun or whatever, it is dispersing them or spreading them out in angle. That's why dispersion is a measure of this spreading. An angular dispersion is d theta by d lambda, mathematically, which means this picture, this is the angular dispersion. Right, d theta by d lambda. So each wavelength is sitting at the respective small uh, bin of the angle. But in fact, the reverse is more useful because you will be measuring, sorry, you will be measuring the wavelengths here on this. So the reverse is true, which means it involves the focal length of the camera lens, and it becomes d theta by d lambda into this. So dl by d lambda. That means in this picture, every millimeter what is the corresponding lambda, right? Or rather lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, like that. So that is defined like this. And dl by d lambda, the reverse of this, in units of angstrom per millimeter, which is the reciprocal dispersion. Which means after all this setup, finally what you're looking for is uh, this large parameter. How many angstroms are there per millimeter? Now, quickly, some uh, thing about gratings. These are very old instruments, more than 100 years old when spectroscopy was started, uh, initially in the lab. And then, of course, in astronomy, the instruments were coupled to the telescope. Uh, 
so, so these are essentially just like a sawtooth thing by using diamond they cut so this is the cut portion of the glass glass blank was this thick and they cut through with diamond and gave this grooves or the rulings as they are called and the light so this is the normal this is just like a mirror this is a reflecting surface coated with aluminium the light comes and goes back almost in the same so so this is called blazing which will you would like the spectrum to be focused in a one particular direction now what is blazing this is clear in this again the sort of kind of uh, rulings on the grating so what is happening so d is the gap between these rulings in small d and uh, these are different angles so this is the normal as if this is a mirror this will be the normal incoming beam a normal light will go out if it is a mirror but if it is blazed then the light will be thrown in a particular direction so that will increase the efficiency so that's why uh, no blaze and blaze you see what are these 0 1 2 3 so this is the white light coming it goes into zero order as if it's a mirror so mostly there is nothing in the zero order because it's not really a mirror the light gets distributed on either side of this zero first second third so you can improve the efficiency of to a particular second or third and use that as the final spectrum and that's why the blazing and orders are related so i will skip this i'll also skip this so this is a nice spectrum of sun taken by a very high resolution called eschel spectrogram now you can see the spectrum starts from here from left side to the almost to the uh the deeper in the blue side and it is split in in branches you know so this is lambda 1 to lambda 2 lambda 3 to lambda 4 like that and it is spread over and this is actually a a ccd uh imager much bigger ccd and you will after taking this image and you can see these lines which are sun's absorption lines because it's a g type star so this is a nice image with very high resolution all the wavelengths from uh, red to blue have been split into these different parts and you can study by moving the 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 cursor on the ccd and you will see the light values and absorptions will show there so then you can actually join them and make a very large spectrum on the x axis so now we will quickly uh, talk about a small thing suppose a very simple grating design how do you want to make a instrument by using grid we are not discussing about the telescope coupling and all that it is further more so suppose you have been given a 50 mm wide 2 inch wide grid and you have to use it under 1/4 meter monochromatic means basically the focal length of the of the collimator and the grating has as i said 1200 lines per millimeter or that many grooves and it is blazed the efficiency improved at the green region at 5000 angstroms which is 500 nanometers and the angle of this blaze is at 17.5 so these are the parameters given and what you are supposed to do is to find the reciprocal linear dispersion which i defined it while ago because that is what is more important how many each millimeter corresponds to what bin of the wavelength lambda 1 lambda 2 what is the theoretical resolution that r which we define and actual resolution will not be as good as theory because there are a lot of scattering and other so it will come down by using a small slit because as i said from the slit the spectrum is moving so i will see the spectrum if it is a 25 micron with slit so given all this this is what i am supposed to calculate again i am not going into the formulas of this grating which can be nicely described in the reference books so pitch is given 200 lines per millimeter and what is the groove spacing 1 by a will give the groove spacing in millimeters or whatever then the blaze wavelength is given the order is first order i showed you different orders and width of the grating is 50 mm focal length is 250 mm and beta this is given as 17.5 so with all these numbers the first formula to be used for angular dispersion is this linear is this which we already defined and finally this is the what we are looking for 10 to the power 6 a cos beta by f into n all these numbers are plugged in you get 3.2 nanometer per millimeter so on the 
CCD image, every millimeter corresponds to 32 angstroms. One nanometer is 10 angstroms, so 32 angstroms. And the theoretical resolution is easy. With this formula, you get 60,000. So we are already into the middle or uh, the medium resolution category. But remember, this is the edge, the theoretical. What you actually do is shine a laser to the instrument. And laser is very thin. I mean, the spectral line is so narrow that you can almost assume it as a delta function. So if you scan it, what effect you will get is the effective resolution of the instrument. If you do that, and use a 25 micron strip, you put all these numbers, you get 6250. So this is 60,000 and this is about 6,000. So 10 times uh, uh, you have lost the resolution. And actually measure it with a laser, as I said, it comes to about one angstrom. So this is the real resolution, which even though you have given the theoretical parameters and design, but ultimately you get one angstrom. And similar calculations can be done for requirement of higher resolution. This, again, I will skip because I have told you about the blazings and other things. These are the definitions, so you can pick them up. Yesterday, somebody wanted the talk uh, PDF. So what has been recited by the organizer, uh, I could not find the link, but they will be putting all the talks whosoever has uh, been ready to give it on a website from where you can download. So I will skip most of these things, I think. Now let me show some nice instruments, real instruments. So this is a telescope. 0.9 meters is the diameter of the telescope, but actually the mirror is here, okay? This is in Arizona uh, at about 2000 uh, meters high mountain where me and my colleagues from Delhi University and the Americans, we collaborated to form a very large spectra set of various stars, almost 1200 stars. So the light comes from sky, hits this mirror, goes here, and then goes down into the next room, which is, so this is the terrace. In fact, you are not even allowed to walk here because it is dangerous. On the last few days of our observation spread over six to seven years, the concerned person also had retired. So we, on our own, even with the risk, went there, but usually you're not allowed to go there because things were not aligned and not much care was taken towards that. This is the telescope which any spectroscopist in the world, not just India, would have experienced using this. This is the veteran telescope and it's solid, you know, nothing uh, can change. And it's, it's such a good instrument. People who are spectroscopists like me have, would have experienced all this. So this is where the light enters the next room that is on the floor, just below the terrace. And the different spectral lamps are here to calibrate the x-axis and so on. And it finally enters one more floor below, which is a huge hall where all this, this is the picture of the grating and other things. And finally, the light comes to a detector, which is here. And it is cooled and you can barely see this is where the detector is. And I don't know whether you can see there is some liquid nitrogen smoke coming out. And this is cooled. So in the evening, the we observe in the night. So the evening, the operator would come and fill the liquid nitrogen. And it's such a stable instrument, the liquid nitrogen will last till morning. So usually in the winter nights, December, January, we will be observing 10 to 12 hours. But in summers, it's obviously less. So this is a very complicated instrument, but at the same time, it is very standard. And this is one example of the spectra for a K-type star. And we call it Indo-US Spectral Library. You Google it and you will find our names there and our collaborators. And Kule Feed CF Library. So when I say library, we had done about 200 different stars, hot and cold stars, and made a huge library of such spectra, right? And where it is used, two things people study the evolution of stars. Somebody had a question yesterday. So then you go deeper, you go into high resolution spectra. Then suppose you have a globular cluster with thousands of stars or a galaxy with again many, many stars. The light from the galaxy comes out, whether it is a young galaxy or, or older galaxy will depend on whether you have younger stars in that or older stars. So the net effect will be thousands of such things all mixed together because you can't distinguish them, right? And then you will do a model. You will take, okay, 10% of hot stars, 40% of media and Cold, or these proportions will vary. And then we will try to fit this combination, which is a statistical game. 
and try to fit to the overall spectrum. And of course, this is what called the synthetic uh, spectrum uh, combination for integrated light from the galaxies. Okay, so that's where there is use. This is looks like a noise, okay, but this is a K-type star. The peak is somewhere in blue, right here, uh, blue green region. And each section, if you expand, this is a real spectrum. So this is a one angstrom resolution spectrum, very high resolution uh, as a part of uh, our library. So that was about the general spectrum. Now I will move on to a quick example of uh, high resolution instrument, which is in this case a Fabry Perot. Now these rings would remind you of neutron rings experiment, but essentially Fabry Perot is just two glass plates sitting absolutely parallel like this. So this was an instrument which we built in our time during PhD in Ahmedabad. And you could see these rings. So what happens is either you can move this plates in a coordinated way, return in its parallelism, then this uh, fringes will either come out or collapse, depending on which way you are moving. And if you put a small aperture here, you will start generating a spectrum. So this is a February paro, and that region is defined by the filter which we used before this. And this gives enormous output, throughput rather, from my definition, for a very narrow bin. So this is how the general optical layout you have an extended source like a galaxy or a nebula like Orion. You focus it, put it in the parallel section. Uh, so make it parallel and this is the focus index. These are the two plates shown as two lines like this. They are highly polished and mirrored. So the light keeps on doing this multiple reflection. A net effect is set of rings on this plate. It's just showing one particular spot here. And so each of this is forming a, so just a minute. So this is how the thing looks. If the plates are perfect, then you will see repetition of this. This is called the airy pattern. That is this repeating of this uh, spectrum. So to isolate this, suppose it is hydrogen H alpha line 65, 60. Then I would put a very narrow two angstrom filter or something. So only that light is allowed to come into the febrifero and then you will see this. So this is, again, not into details, but the references will tell you. This is the basic equation where you change the wavelength, just like any spectrometer, by three parameters, one, two, and three. Theta means the whole eternal shifts, which is tilted, which is nonlinear. It's a difficult thing, but some specific applications require. T is you change the gap, and mu is the gas inside, which in this case could be air or high refractive index gas, you change the refractive index. And changing the refractive index is directly proportional to the pressure. So if you change the pressure of the gas, the mu will change. So at a time, you will do only one. So suppose you want lambda to be changed, that is those fringes to move in the central or the rings to collapse. One way is to change the refractive index by pressure. Then spacer and of course theta but it's not so much used and again all these basic parameters like geometric spacing order of interference all that is there so i'm skipping all this but essentially concentrated again on this vary the mu which is the varying the pressure and it's called pressure scan piezo so this was a challenge you know about 30 40 years back how do you maintain the parallelism at the same time move it so the only solution was i will show a picture later so these plates are from the top, you will see it as a circle, right? There is a coated portion. So there are three points where the support has been given and maintain it perfectly. And these are actually what is called optical contact. It is a very special technique where the surface is already very highly polished. And these three optical bars or whatever you call it, the ends have been highly polished. So they pressure in such a way that they optically contact. I mean, unless you give a very strong force, it will slide out, otherwise it will stay. It's a very special technique, optical technique. And of course, how do you check this? You put small patches on the sides and measure the capacitance. So two sets, CX2 and CY, and any change in the capacitance will be a feedback loop and you can maintain it steady. So that was a challenge which was improvised with the astronomer who sort of us who 
make it into an industry. So we'll see some of those pictures. So let's see. Uh, so this is again a French word because the, in fact, in France, they don't even call it Fabry Perot. They call it Perot Fabry because Perot was French and Fabry was British. So this is the airy function. I have defined it here. So we'll, so various things can happen. One is, of course, the area, the basic reflectivity is giving rent to this. But what can happen? There could be a misalignment. There could be a polish in there. There could be various other things. So there are five such things which affect the net thing. So reflection is the basic thing. And this is, of course, again showing the same picture. And this is the area pattern. Then the plates could be sagging. Now you will see that, okay, this is glass, so how can it sag? But you see, we are talking of angstrom. So any slight sagging also will give rise to uh, the broadening of the instrument effect. So this is again a rectangular function. This can be derived. And then as I said, misalignment. In fact, it's interesting that this publication, me and my junior colleague, we did it in 1991. Um, this was not really known, even though this technology has been 100 years old. The February is early 1910 or something. But somehow this actual theoretical calculation was missed out. People were knowing about the missile. Well, this gave us a nice, you know, high uh, impact of uh, applied optics paper. So we devised a way to quantify that. And it's a parabolic function. Then, of course, I told polishing defects. So this anything which is random typically can be assigned to a Gaussian effect. So this is a Microsoft myth, and this is, of course, a Gaussian function. Misalignment, Gaussian. I stopped moving. So let me, yeah, somehow stop moving. Okay, then the small aperture which you will use, aperture being an aperture, it will be a simple. Whole, so it will be a rectangular function. And finally, the instrument is a convolution of all these. You know, the airy function, the plate defect, which is the uh, sagging, the misalignment, uh, polishing, and aperture. And what essentially you do a convolution, this is a very basic base level mathematics. Two quantities, the star is not multiplication. This is the integration. And you can very nicely do this on two transparent graph sheets and keep doing this and taking the total area, you can two Gaussians, you will get another Gaussian. So that is only basics mathematics. So this is how it is done. So what you observe is the source profile and the instrument. So suppose the Orion Nebula a green line 5007 angstrom, which is nicely seen, is a broadened, monoplar broadened line, and you're observing with the instrument, which is narrow, then you the, what you actually see is the recorded spectrum, which is a convolution of this. So if you know this instrument with a laser scanning or something, you can deconvol and get the uh, source profile. And then from the Doppler plotting, you can get the tab. This is the standard way to do observations with Febri-Perot. So I'll skip some of these things. Just to show you a picture of febri -Perot. this is how the couplers and electronics things are. These inside of the two plates, you can barely see them. And these three points, they are supported. And this is the side view of that. This is another view of that. Now, the last few minutes, I will just spend what you do when you want to do, make an observation. Particularly, spectroscopy is much more complicated. So you have to plan what are the objects. So for example, Sirius spectra, which is a standard star, let us say, and some star which is unknown, whose spectra you don't know. So first, you will, of course, observe the standard star, and it should be available in the sky, in your part of the globe and so on. And it should have similar brightness. Otherwise, suppose the standard star is very bright and a very faint star you're doing. So there is a scaling issue there. And which grating you have to use. I showed the spectrum of high resolution. So which part of the spectrum you are interested. In. And of course, the x-axis has to be calibrated with a lamp, which could be mercury or other elements. And what is the procedure for each spectra? Take the spectral lamp. Take a white light because you have to correct for the continuum and observe a standard star and the required object and keep doing this and finally use a software to analyze the data. So this is a nice picture of the helium neon lamp and you can see many, many emission lines here. 
And these lines have are known what are the wavelengths of this. So once you know the x-axis, then you can, uh, so this is the halogen lamp, of white light, and you can see this side is blue and this side is red. So it is more brighter because blue sensitivity of a CCD is very poor, whereas in red it is much more. So you have to correct for this variation. You have to make it uniform. So that is another factor which comes. And this is a standard star. In this case, you can barely see some dips here, which is a hot star. And this is what the star spectrum will be on the CCD. Most of it, this part is sky, okay? Only the star has come in the, in the slit. And this is the interesting object, which was in this case a supernova. And of course, there is a bright atmosphere light coming in through the slit, but this is a supernova spectrum here. So what you do is, first by the software, you find out the x-axis. In this case, it's 6,000 to 8,000 and different lines, the helium neon lines are coming in vertically, it is written. This is a standard procedure. Then you have established the x-axis. Then this is the effect of the white light, as I said, it's the poor sensitivity in the blue side. So you have to inverse this, so that this becomes a perfectly straight. So that mathematical operation has to be done all along the x-axis. And then finally, you see the standard star. You can see this is the H beta here, H alpha here, sorry, H alpha here and other lines. This is a hot star. And by this procedure called IRF, there are other softwares which give you the spectrum. Now this spectrum has been observed by you and similarly other parts of the world, people have observed the standard star. So now you have a Y axis which can be calibrated. Once you have done that, your Y axis and X axis are known for a standard star. Now you use the uh, target, which is supernova in this case, and this you get the calibrated uh, spectrum of the supernova. So this is the overall procedure. It's elaborate, but there are softwares which are doing much faster. So in case of Arizona, I told you we did 200 stars. So all the night, every night, we could do about 100 stars. And of course, in the daytime, it's a tough life. You know, daytime, you're not even able to sleep much. You have to analyze this and see whether everything is okay. Otherwise, you have to go back again in, in that evening and again observe that star. So it took six to seven years, but finally the whole library, uh, CFLib, if you just type or into US CFLib, you will see 1200 spectra sitting there. I think I have to stop here and I will just list out some books. Uh, this is a very basic astronomical spectroscopy. Most of these are available as eBooks also. Then this is another book, a little more technical on spectroscopy. This is a very nice book by a uh, UK lady, uh, A.P. Thorn, and the second, I think this is 88, but the new version would have come. Uh, this is a very nice book. In fact, uh, for one night I was busy uh, in the observatory and there was no observation. So I, it's just like a novel, you know, all this Doppler bottling, everything, each chapter with very little mathematics. So it's a nice book. I strongly recommend you. Uh, use it, and it's. I think it's also on the ebook thing. Then this is a Fabry Perot interferometer book. Um, this book, the name is very misleading, electronic imaging and all that. I think this is the latest or one more version. Here, most of the details about detectors, CCD, the kind of processing I mentioned, is there in this book. This is a very nice book, Ian McLean, and this is about spectral classification, more technical things. Uh, about this OBA, you know, spectral types. And this is just to promote my book. This is an IGNU book, which was made, or rather we were told to do it in such a way that the student doesn't need a teacher. So self-reading thing, it's available on internet. And uh, it's actually very cheap. I think it was IGNU, so it used to be 500 rupees. I don't know whether it is still in publication, but it's available. Online. So there are several, uh, what you call volumes, uh, two of the chapters on this optical astronomy observation, me and some of my colleagues have written. So I strongly suggest you go through this because it has very basic information which was covered in these lectures. So what I'm going to do is I will now stop sharing and uh, we can do one thing. Uh, Google Sheet is easy because once you send your... 10, 15 questions, I will answer them uh, one by one later in the day. And uh, we can take some questions now in the next five, 10 minutes. So you can just raise your hand and then
who is the first one to raise any questions yeah uh, it's a shlok sha yes unmute and ask yes yes sha you ask you have unmuted but no you have to unmute yourself sha is not unmuting okay saurav you unmute and ask what's happening they are not able to unmute saurav aslam shlok subrata any one of you unmute and ask unless you unmute i can't hear you none of the people who have raised hand are asking unless you unmute i can't hear you five persons have raised hand divakar datta shlok Aslam, Saurav, and Subrata. Any one of you want to ask? You have to unmute yourself. You are, you are muted. Who is asking? Lok Shah, you have unmuted. You can ask. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. I'm audible. Actually, we didn't have the permission to unmute ourselves. Like this. Uh, Santosh, can you give permission to others to unmute so that I think they are facing some difficulty? Santosh, you can give general permission to them too. I can. Hello. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Speak. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what makes Fabry Perot interferometry unique, like with respect to other interferometry methods? So, as I said, uh, it's a very specific instrument for a very specific region of the line. So, suppose you want to study a spectral line only and nothing else. In this case of Orion, an example, five zero zero seven, then it is ideal because it will go into finer details of the spectral line. you don't spend time on the remaining part of the spectrum so that's why it is unique and of course the output is much more in that particular thing okay who is the next unmute Hello. who so where is unmuted just ask uh, yeah uh, yeah uh, uh, can you hear me uh, this is subrata ah uh, yes ask Ha. no i was uh, just wondering uh, this uh, the airy pattern that uh, fabry per So it alone will produce. Uh, can you also couple it to, uh, let's say, the CCD camera so that uh, you can uh, you can uh, measure the width of the fringes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, every pattern is just the reflectivity, but what you finally see from the instrument is a convolution of all the effects. But yes, I mean the rings can be imaged on a CCD, and then you can scan the image and find the width. That is the technique to be used finally. Yes, it can be imaged. Okay. Okay, and and the, uh, just 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 one one uh, follow up. Uh, so the formulas that that you showed, uh, did they uh, carry uh, um, using that uh, width of the uh, the pattern? Uh, can one detect? Can one find out the star parameters? Like uh, yeah. So uh, as I said, if you shine a laser to the instrument before taking the spectra from the star or Orion Nebula, you will get the instrument's own effect. Which can be let's say 0.5 angstrom, and the broadening which you are expected to measure is say 1.5. So what you will do, then you will observe it, and you get a net spectrum. You deconvolve, so remove the instrument part by deconvolve, and then uh, get the uh, what you call the Gaussian part of the source, and then you use that formula get the temperature. Yes, that's how it is to be done. Next, who is the person? 
whosoever has to ask has to unmute hello sir uh, and there yes ask sir uh, so what is the average uh, magnetic field of the sun uh, sir so as i said the earth is 0.5 gauss and on surface of sun typically it is about 1 gauss not very different from okay. uh, from so earth. why so the difference between between uh, uh, why uh, the uh, the magnetic field difference between sunspot and uh, surface of the sun uh, so you ask this question to the person like uh, nishant or somebody will take a class okay. Uh, okay. the sunspots are very special parts of sun where there is a concentration of magnetic fields and that's why the magnetic field is very high and of course it looks dark because of uh, various other things so best is to ask this when the solar lecture is there but yes okay. the magnetic field at the sun spots can be extremely high okay okay Next. sir thank you sir ha huh. sort of uh, uh, sir uh, in the blaine's rating uh, do we have uh, the blaine's output and normal output together or uh, any one of them no 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 it will so the whole purpose of blazing is that you put most of the energy in that particular order so for example the example i gave in first order it was designed so that all other orders are separate but of course uh, the related uh, point which i didn't make it clear the effect from other orders will also sit on that which means other orders have to be filtered out with a uh, filter which will allow only the first order light to come so that's a technical thing yes Uh, filters have to be used, and sometimes even prisms are used as filters. Okay, so that answers your question that only the blazed light is to be used. Next, who is next? Is it Aslam or? Ah, ah, Bharat. No, I don't see any. Can you explain the blur effect again? Uh, just. What is your name? Hello, you speak loudly. I can't hear. Hello. Ah. Huh. Is it Bharti? Ah yes, sir. Uh, speak. Sir, ah, uh, sir. While explaining crystallography to students, we are uh, telling them that uh, we can't use uh, plane diffraction grating as the number of lines per inch are very low. That is fifteen thousand per. Uh, inch, but uh, the grating that you have used, it has the resolution of one angstrom or so. Can uh, it be used to study crystal structure or X-ray refraction? Okay, so this is a solid-state physics question. Firstly, fifty thousand per inch is a very good number. Um, it will render a very high resolution. But uh, there are things here. When you talk of crystal structure, you are talking of x-rays so the gratings can be used in x-rays yes but the whole optics and all the formulas will have a different effect so x-ray crystallography is your question and again gratings can be used the grating uh, grooves and all will be very different from optical grooves so that's why that robinson's book which i put in the list you can go through that this has some special chapter on the x-ray grating also but basic principle is same because x-ray is also an electromagnetic Radiation, whether it is optics, infrared, or X-ray, it's ultimately the. Except that in X-rays are too small wavelength, so they start interacting with the atomic structure. That's how you find the crystallography. Thank you. Who is the next? Hello, sir. Ah, uh, Aslam. Sir, sir, you described about the broadening and how do we distinguish between this? One is from natural broadening and other. Ah, uh, so that's a good question. So suppose in case of Orion example, natural is already sitting there. Okay, okay. and since the orion gas is at a hotter temperature it rides over that narrow thing so only way to distinguish is in lab it is possible what you do is you cool down the gas right to a very low temperature then you will not see the doppler broadening but you will see the natural broadening but yes it's a combined effect which you are seeing in case of astronomy you can't tell so the you have to only make assumption that the natural broadening is of course always narrow and uh, whatever effect is seen only by the doppler broadening so in case of rotational broadening also similar thing will happen so you have to first calibrate the observation with the uh, instrument's uh, laser scan or something and then you know the instrument effect and you remove the effect by decomposition next thank you sir hello sir ha can you explain the work i speak little loudly 
I can't hear you. Can you explain the request again? Ah, your your voice is very low. Yes, sir. Can you explain double effect again? Yeah, now now the, the part question. of double effect. What is the question? Can you explain the part of double effect again? Double effect. Which effect? Double effect. Double effect. Double effect. So as I said, uh, yes. I give a nice example of a uh, person holding a tube light. If he is not moving. Then uh, you are just seeing the broadening due to the mercury atoms inside the tube, which I nicely showed in that picture. But suppose the person is running away or approaching you, then the same spectrum will be shifting. If it is approaching you, with of course the speed has to be much closer to speed of light to see the effect. And in case of astronomy, that is possible, not on Earth. Then you will see uh, the blue shift of the whole spectrum or the red shift. But the spectrum broadening will still be there. So the Doppler effect is a combined word for both the effects together. Okay, next. Okay, thank you. Who is the next person asking? Anyone has to unmute and ask. Hello, sir. Ah, Subhadi. Ah. Sir, uh, we also used uh, distance uh, by using a gravitational uh, lensing technique. Uh, so, what is the uh, connection uh, between gravitational lensing and spectroscopy, or what is the difference? Why we so need you, to introduce? You have asked this question in the Google sheet, and I told you you ask it to the person who will be explaining gravity, uh, gravitational lensing. It's not directly related to what I talk. There are different ways of measuring distances in gravitational lensing. It's totally different effect. So I will not be able to answer that. You ask to the person who will talk about gravity, gravitational lensing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Who is the next? Sir. Ha. Huh. Sir, how to connect the timing of stars rotation from broadening of spectra? Um. So, so rotation of the star and its own temperature are uh, the effects will be merged. So it will not be easy to find out whether the star is rotating and the spectrum you see uh, will have a uh, broadening. But of course, as I said, uh, the spectrum will be shifting like this in time. Okay, like with my fingers I showed. So that's an indication that the star is rotating. Over and above, each line will be broadened anyway. So then you can use either a very high resolution instrument to find the width of that line uh, or a Fabry Perot. But yes, the effect of rotation will be seen when the spectrum is kind of wiggling uh, left and right. Okay, next. Who is next? Weber. No. Who is? Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, sir, in telescope, uh, like uh, uh, the simple lens doesn't catch uh, UV lights. So instead of uh, uh, that simple lens, we can use a cryolite uh, uh, crystal as a lens uh, so that uh, we can uh, also get uh, the UV spectra from the telescope. So okay, the answer possible. to that is, uh, as I said, uh, when you use a telescope, typically it's a mirror base. So mirror will reflect uh, also the ultraviolet, but the efficiency will be less. So there are special coatings which allow the ultraviolet light to be reflected into the detector. And number two, you asked about a special crystal. Yes, the glass will not pass ultraviolet. So some crystals like potassium, I think potassium chloride, and they allow ultraviolet. But limitations are there, of course. So the glass will definitely not allow the uh, what you call the, the the ultraviolet. But quartz allows. Quartz allows the ultraviolet. And uh, so, what about cryolite crystal? Same thing, all crystals have different properties. So you have to check cryolite whether it allows what it is. Not just cryolite, any other crystal will also depends on its structure and whether it allows, like quartz allows uh, ultraviolet, as I said. Who is the next? Okay, sir. Somebody, Ajay is remaining fast. <laughs> there is background noise. <laughs> I can hear some background thing unless that stops. I can't hear. Uh, 
Yes, sir, I want to ask that why are CCDs preferred over any other detectors like uh, CMOS? See, as I already said, CCD is a digital device, so very easy to analyze the data. Earlier, you had to do scanning and all that. In fact, now there are CMOS devices also, which is also a CCD. CMOS is even more sensitive than the pure silicon device. So yes, CCDs are the only detectors now for experimental astronomy, physics, and 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 any experiment for that matter. Because CCD is highly efficient. I did not give a separate set of lecture on the instruments. CCD efficiency, particularly in the near infrared or in the red, can be as high as 95%, whereas human eye sensitivity is only less than 1%. So you can imagine the amount of uh, advantage you have with CCD. So that's why it has given a boost in addition to all the other things like linearity and other things. So yes, I mean, the book of Maclean will tell you all the advantages of CCD. Next. Who is next? Is there anybody remaining? I think all have answered. So what I'm going to do is I will uh, leave the things now and you can put in if there are any more questions. Don't repeat the same questions on the Google sheet. I will try to answer them in a uh, by today or tomorrow. And thanks for listening to these talks. And the talk PDF is a single PDF will be uploaded by uh, the organizer and they will probably announce the site where they're uploading. I, I have no idea where they're uploading. So thank you, everybody, and have the best wishes for the remaining lectures. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.